<clears throat> All right, we're live. Hello, and everybody, welcome to Facilitating XYZ Live. This is a show about facilitation where it's our job to interview a facilitator and learn from them. Um, and with any luck, um, learn from them in a way that benefits all facilitators. My name is Sam Killerman. Hello, the... This is a show of ah, I have the tab open. Here. Okay, and now it's closed. That was one of the worst experiences of my life. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, my name is Sam, and I'm one of the co-hosts of this show, one of the co-facilitators of Facilitating XYZ, which is a free online resource for all facilitators. This show is part of that resource. Um, and in addition to this show, there's other things like articles and downloads and lots of great community-created resources. So with that said, our special guest today is Peter Duran, who is going to introduce himself in a little bit. But before that, Meg, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Meg Bolger, and I'm one of the other co-facilitators of Facilitating XYZ and co-host of this show. And um, as Sam mentioned, this is a show where we get to bring on folks and try to learn from their experience, their expertise. And um, today, we get to talk to Peter Duran, who will introduce himself in just a moment. And I'm really excited about this. I found Peter on the internet um, uh, when I was kind of exploring this field and world of, of graphic facilitation and um, really excited to, to get to dig into that with, with Peter amongst other things. So Peter, if you wouldn't mind kicking it off and just telling us a little bit about you. Great, well, hey everybody, thank you Meg, thank you Sam. I think what you are building here is fantastic. Uh, it, being a facilitator, it can be a lonely endeavor, especially when you're working with clients on something that you're maybe a little not familiar with, and then you're facilitating clients. Um, so I, am a, I have a career in facilitation, um, but it's, it was very much a circuitous path to that world through art school, through um, living in Eastern Europe after the Berlin Wall came down in Poland and Russia and traveling around. Um, background of being uh, not only an artist, but a teacher, first of English as a second language, and then of uh, other subjects related to facilitation, graphics, illustration. Um, and the shortest version is I, I had spent almost five years hitchhiking around Europe, Eastern Europe, Russia, having lots of experiences, filling up journals and sketchbooks with lots of visuals, trying to understand a very complex and changing world. And um, then I landed in Chicago in cubicle land as a temp. So I went from all of that excitement and energy to working in a cubicle, making PowerPoint slides with bullet points and about to chew my arm off like a coyote in a trap. <laughs> and uh, so, I was complaining a lot to my friend who worked at the temp agency that this was pretty suboptimal. There were so many more exciting ways for people to learn, to digest information, to solve problems. And this was the early 90s, so just as the internet was coming into its own. And she said, I don't, I, I don't know what to do with you. Um, but one day she got a weird job request, and she said, I have no idea what they do there but it mentioned drawing and you should go check it out. And it turned out that it was an innovation center, which meant there were a lot of whiteboards and a lot of people that get together and talk about things. And I walked in and the, the guy running the place said, I hear you can draw. And I said, yeah, I went to art school. And he said, well, I'm gonna start talking. You take this whiteboard marker and just draw whatever comes to your mind. And he started speaking a language that I thought was English, but it, I didn't understand any of the vocabulary words. He was talking about leveraging core competencies to maximize shareholder value. And just these, they sounded like made up job <laughs> we took. And so I was drawing as best I could. He mentioned something about a battle or a fight or a castle. So I drew that. And then I just picked out uh, visuals in his language, not understanding anything. And I thought for sure, I have blown this. I am not getting whatever this crazy job is. And he turned around, he looked at it, and he said, that's perfect. And that was the start of my career as a graphic facilitator, was working with people who were figuring out big, complex uh, systems, technology, business problems, and using drawing to help illuminate those. Huh, Peter, that's, so when, what year was that, like roughly, when you, when you? That was exactly August of 1996. <laughs> awesome, I love the specificity. Um, August of 96. 
So I've been learning more about graphic facilitation. It feels like it's either gotten more popular or it's just gotten more into my life in the last few years. I've seen it at conferences and it seems like maybe there are more people doing that. At that time, did you know that that was even a thing? Like, did you know that that existed? Well, I, I went to art school, as I mentioned, and I was in the illustration and, and design program. And um, we were really being trained to receive a design brief or job request to do sketches or early drafts, send those to a client who would send it to their client. Then we'd get feedback. Then we'd do the final thing. And it would just go off through the mail. No, there's no internet through the mail and then just maybe be published. But we would never have any interaction with the audience. So seeing something like this was very familiar to me as a teacher. Yeah. In Poland, I didn't have any textbooks. So I just had kids make their own stuff, you know, three-dimensional objects, cutting up magazines. So that was very familiar to me. And so to see this world where grown-ups, in quotes, in dockers and button-down blue shirts were using the same thing, but they were trying to figure out how to run a supply chain through all of Asia for whatever big company and use big complex software packages. Um, that's where I saw that this is a tool. It's a tool for people to get clarity. It's a tool for people to discuss on a different level about systems rather than opinions or roles. You know, roles being you know, marketing, arguing with sales, arguing with IT, arguing with the business side. So I, I saw that, and, and I wasn't, the only one to see this, that's why they used it in this innovation center. Right. It, when did you, so that's an awesome start. Like you literally were just handed a marker and like, go for it, right? And you had no idea it existed. When, um, like, so what happened after that? And like, when did it start to become clear to you? Like, oh, other people do this. Other people do this for a living, like, or, or consistently for a job, not as a temp. Like, when did, how did that journey go about? Come about. I, I was very fortunate. I basically staggered into a fully functional world where there were full-time employees of the large consulting firm. There were contractors. There were clients, and it was uh, it was just part of the tool set. So it wasn't that I had to seek it. I landed in the middle of it, cool. and I had um, people that became my heroes. I watched them listening to this business speak and they would seem to understand everything and they were up there writing and drawing and looked very competent and uh, then as i got to know them i realized they don't they don't know what anybody's saying either you know but that's <laughs> the, point. the point is to channel content and turn it and iterate it into a form that is helpful to your audience and that's the measure of success is what we're creating whether it's verbal or or a, a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint presentation or drawing, is it helpful to other people to understand a complex situation and make good decisions? And that's really how I've boiled it down. When people ask, you know, what, what's this good for and what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I help people to see very complex situations so that they can work together to make good decisions. So how long about, it's not about art. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Like that's so in in art and design land, there's a often you'll hear people arguing: is this art? Is it design? You can read fun medium posts about that or whatever. But you're getting at something completely different. It's more just communication, right? Like it's it's visual communication. It is it design? Like how do you feel about that that debate as it relates to your work? It, it's uh, well, it, in the world of facilitation, it's about discovery. Ah. So to me, communication. We think of it as a two-way street, but oftentimes in corporate communications, it's a one-way street. You produce a thing after a lot of work, you send it out in the world, and you hope that it connects with your audience, and they, there's a call to action, and they complete that action. Very different from a group of people gathering around a problem that no one has the answer to, and asking, what is this problem? What are all the parts of this problem? What are the potential future trends that will impact the situation, how might we create scenarios or prototypes or rough drafts or strategies to, to address this future that, we, that no one's clear about? A whole different thing, right? That's not communication, that's discovery. 
Mm. Yeah, I appreciate it. Sam, you look like you're about to say something. Yeah, so is that like, so I've, I've heard when it comes to graphic facilitation, people use different words to describe their work. Like I've seen graphic recording, I've seen graphic facilitation, visual facilitation. Like there's lots of different um, phrases. Are those communicating very different types of work or are they different words that describe the same job? Um, as in any field, the parsing of words can become a civil war. At <laughs> okay. No. Um, so here, here, I'll share you my understanding, the way yeah. I it, so I don't pretend to be the authority on this. But, uh, <laughs> so graphic recording is a mode. So it's a, it's a mode of listening and creating a visual that hopefully records uh, the conversation or the content that's being delivered. And then that asset, those drawings, can be used for different purposes, to communicate to people outside of the room or to use in the room as an iteration of ideas to do the next body of work. So that's graphic recording. Graphic facilitation is, uh, is a slightly different mode, which is you, if you're the graphic, if you're the facilitator, you know that you have to understand the problem and the uh, dynamics of the group coming in, where they're starting from, what they want to uh, address, and where th what the outputs are, what the goals are. So in that case, the graphic facilitator is using graphics or templates. Um, the Grove is really the leader in producing templates that facilitators can use to guide a group from through a process. Um, and so it's that the emphasis is on process Whereas a graphic recorder, the emphasis is, is on capture, capturing the content. Um, and then in between are a whole bunch of other phrases that basically cover the same territory of visual facilitator, visual practice, visual practitioner, visual harvester is another one. Um, yes. So in Europe, that's a term that's, that's used quite a lot is harvesting uh, ideas. Um, and in the end, it's language that we create to help our clients know what mode we're working in and, and how to use us. Yeah, that, that's really helpful. So one thing that um, that I would be interested in talking about, <clears throat> is something in our earlier conversation when we connected was you expressed like a, a real passion for the pre-work, like or like a real like, um, yeah, I don't know if passion is the right word, but just that you were very aware of the importance of the work that happens before you get into a room. And when you were just talking about like their, you know, graphic facilitation, you need to understand the problem, like what the group is coming in with, all of those types of things. I'm wondering if you can speak to a little bit about like what what does that pre-work look like, or how do you how do you get the answers to all of those things before you get in the room? Mm -hmm. um, well, this gets back to the the different modes and mm -hmm. those roles of graphic facilitator versus graphic recorder. So I'll start with graphic recorder. Oftentimes when I'm doing graphic recording, meaning I'm off to the side, I'm in the back, or maybe I'm on stage listening and drawing, uh, the organizers will ask, hey, do you want a copy of everybody's slides? And I will say, absolutely not. Because then I'm thinking about what I read and guessing what they're going to say versus being in the moment. So graphic recording is, if we use a theater analogy, is much more like improv. So you're, you're picking up the patterns that are being laid down and responding to them in real time. Graphic facilitation is much more, well, it's not identical, but to use that theater um, analogy, it's much more like a scripted show. You know that you may be doing this module or activity right now, but the output from that is going to feed as input into the next activity and the next activity with this ultimate goal in mind and these concrete objectives and outcomes. Um, and if you're a graphic or facilitator or on a facilitation team, most events I do are a team, whether that's a two-person team or a 20-person team, then that's where it's important to do that pre-work, understand what are the different underlying issues, different dynamics, and of course, uh, specific vocabulary. As you know, kind of working with different clients, Somebody talks about a DRG, you don't know if that's a person, a place, a thing, a program, a, a building, a government, a 
disease, you don't know what that acronym is. So having that specific language beforehand is uh, is essential. Um, yeah. So uh, oh. and just one, one more yeah. part of that is in terms of what I do, I spend maybe half of my time graphic recording, the other half uh, facilitating. And the facilitation process, as you, you know and your guests know, that begins from that first phone call. When somebody says, hey, I might be interested in having you help with an event, that's when the facilitation process starts. And in every call or meeting or design email that goes out, um, and that was something that I was taught, is you don't just show up in the front of the room. You go, it begins with facilitating your client through a process beginning from the first touch point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, do you use facilitation or graphic recording in that facilitation of the clients? Like, do you use it internally within AlphaChimp or within like your the, those facilitation teams that you were talking about? Absolutely, yes. Um, even on a, a Skype call like this, um, I, I moved out to out from my cave to the living room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely looks like a bunker or my parents' basement. Okay. Um, but in there, I have a big Wacom tablet. It's a giant iPad thing. There you go. Yep. That's it. And so I will take visual notes during any call, uh, whether that's being projected or sent out afterwards, to start that pattern of, of using the visuals as a tool for understanding a complex situation so we can make good decisions. And then those drawings just become part of the... Uh, I call them the sponsor team, but the sponsor team notes that we send out. So if we're on sponsor team meeting number three, we'll send out all the other visual notes from meetings one and two. Uh, and to emphasize, this is a tool for doing work. So w when you say sponsor team, that, that language doesn't, uh, I don't use that language. What does that language mean? Um, for me, it's whoever is paying for the People to get together and owns the output of that facilitated event. Okay. So, um, they may or may not be funding it, but they, you know, they're the ones that know the context. They are, they could be a participants when we actually do the facilitated event. They then nobody sees them on stage, but they own the output. Um, so so like the them, some people call it client team, sponsor yeah. team, design team, facilitation team. Cool. But it's them, not you, I guess, is what, Meg, is that what you were struggling? Because that's what I, I wasn't sure if that meant, like, your team or their the people, the people bringing you in. Yes, the people bringing you in and the people, okay. Um, and, Peter, so when you're you're doing that and that's, I'm guessing it's serving two purposes, right? Like, so you're using graphic recording and facilitation in your process because it's helpful to um, keep facilitating the client and getting them a, giving them a better sense of what you're doing. But you're also using it because you find it uniquely useful, I'm guessing, right? Like you find that form of like note taking essentially uniquely um, beneficial. Well, I, I was that kid in the back of class who was always like squirming and doodling. And I, I hats off to all of you who can sit in an auditorium and stare at a speaker and retain information that's coming out. I was not <laughs> that kid. In fact, I was looking for my 11th grade English lit book. Oh, you still have it? That's awesome. Um, but you are the kid who keeps left. your 11th grade English lit book. <laughs> well, it, hold on. <laughs> we interrupt this program for a commercial break. Here it is. From the chimp in the background. OK. Shakespeare, Jonathan Swift, here the end. <laughs> So, you know, that's what I was up to in 11th grade and have not really matured since then. Yeah, the whole book is, is pretty much filled with all that stuff. Nice. So that, I, I'm a visual kinesthetic learner. And uh, I think that's why when I went to art school, I, I was with all my visual kinesthetic peers who, let's face it, there's a prejudice against the creative arts and that they're not smart or they're special, they're on a special program. Um, holy crap, the smartest people I met was in art school because uh, 
They tend to be curious in so many different areas and are assembling, you know, are, are taking things from all different areas and putting them together, um, not looking for the right answer, but the right process to lead you to a creative output. I, I appreciate you saying that. And I, I was asking that with a very, like, I, I had a feeling I that you were going to um, uh, be on board with with graphic facilitation for, for very personal reasons. And I, I'm also curious if you can, so in that, like, that prejudice you were just talking about, right? Like, there is kind of a, there's definitely a prejudice against certain forms of art and certain, like, artists and maybe held as inferior to other ways of doing business, other, like, modes of thinking or modes of, of communicating. Um, why do you think that facilitation, graphic facilitation is like uniquely capable or in what ways is graphic facilitation uniquely capable of doing things that other note taking or like typical stenography or typical like PowerPoint slides just aren't? Uh, once again, it comes back to modes and modalities and, and different ways of learning and communicating. Um, I think well, first of all, today is completely different than when I started in 1996. Wow. So in 1996, all of this was pretty exotic. Even the discussion of open floor plans for businesses was pretty weird. And then we got into startup land uh, in the early 2000s, still exotic. And now um, many of my major global clients, that's the norm. So corporate CEO suite level offices are completely different in terms of furniture, layout, tools, visual access. Um, it's, a, it's a different world today. So I don't think it's a analog choice between this thing and that thing. It's, it's that so many tools are available. The hard part is still that design process of what do I use in terms of content and form to move people from one state of knowing or being to another. And yeah. that is uh, that's an that's a curatorial and editorial process. And when should people use graphic facilitation? Like it's, I, I feel like it's uh, something that's trendy. People are like, let's use it for everything. But I don't know if it would be good for everything. Like, when is it uniquely helpful? Like, when should people say, like, that's what we absolutely need, and we need to find someone to come in and help us in that way? Mm -hmm. um, well, I I think everything's an experiment. First of all, so if, if you're curating or designing an event, experiment with different ways of working with your client. Um, graphic recording is very helpful in most contexts where you're dealing with complex stuff. And it's hard for people, for all of us, to remember the volume of information that's thrown at us. And so what I see people the way I see participants in an event using the graphic recording afterwards, so let's say it's on big sheets of paper or foam core or white walls or whatever, is that reflective time. So they'll go back and they'll move through the drawings and make connections in the content in a nonlinear way that helps them remember what was presented and hopefully helps them make connections to lead them to do new ideas. And it's a synthesis process. So it gives them material to help them synthesize all of this information that's been thrown at them, uh, especially if you're in a three-day strategic planning event. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just another way to iterate content in a way that helps people synthesize and remember and retain. So that's one as an individual. And then two is as a group is to look at it and say, hey, remember back on day one when we were talking about artificial intelligence? And we did all this brainstorming out here. What if we took that one little bullet point and we combined it with this thing about workforce development and we came up with a prototype of an experiment we run, on, we run in our, our company. So it's kind of like a uh, recipe book where you have all the ingredients laid out and then people can choose from those ingredients and iterate them for whatever comes next. And what, what strikes me about that, too, is that there, because it's not like all linear and because there is like an aspect of creativity just in the process of creating it, it also perhaps like allows people to get out of their heads more and to see connections they wouldn't have seen otherwise. 
or to like, like you said, like, oh, let's try an experiment, right? Like, what about if we put this next to this? And just the permission to like do an experiment, right? Or to see something experimentally, um, like to approach it with a might, right? Rather than like a should. Um, that's something that's been coming up in our conversations. Like that seems in and of itself valuable. Like just the barriers that it would uh, break down for people to approach a problem more creatively. Um, and if I might, I'd like to talk about barriers and that compartmentalizing that we all do and people do with creative folks. So they'll say, oh, you're so artistic. I don't have an artistic bone in my body. I can never do what you do or whatever. However, they frame that shame. Oh, my vape. Like that. Yeah. 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 Well, what I've seen is it's, a, it's an expression of shame and anxiety. So somewhere along their path, they were told, you can't do this and you're not worthy to do it and don't even try doing that. So one of my jobs in the world is to lower people's uh, levels of shame and anxiety, period, no matter what we're doing. And then with the graphic recording stuff, especially when I do the trainings, it's called Rockstar Scribe. So it's meant to be very fun and engaging. And uh, the it's not even to teach people to draw. It's just to lower it the threshold of shame and anxiety through giving some sort of mastery and competence. It's like learning to cook or play tennis or tango dance. People come with an expectation, I can't. They learn a couple of techniques or tools and then they play with those and they say, oh, I can. That's, that's as facilitators and teachers and coaches and therapists, when you move somebody from a I can't to I can or I might be able to, you shifted somebody's life. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a game changer. What are some things you've seen that work? Or like, what are what, what are some things that you've learned that work with helping make that shift from the shame and anxiety preventing someone from even thinking that they can to someone being like, maybe I can. Like, um, what, what works? That's such a huge, that for me, that feels like a mountain to climb. Right. Um, well, uh, I could show you some stuff. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Let me, um, so th the general theme for what I'm about to show you is just going from nothing to creating something. And okay. once you people see they can go from blank wall or nothing to creating something, you, you've accomplished that goal, which is proving it's they're able to do it. And the, uh, the other core principle is uh, moving people to a state of positive expectancy. And this is a core um, principle for therapy and for be positive behavior, behavior change, whether it's quitting smoking, losing weight, or exercising more, or learning how to program. It's moving people to that state of positive expectancy, which means they can see that it's possible, and then they have the first steps for how to do it. Okay. So that's one thing I'd, I would like to share is that our job, anybody on watching this right now, your job is to move people to a state of positive expectancy. And whatever tools work, go for it. Hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, so let me know when it's showing. Yep. We've got your slides. Here's, here's the, the alpha champ in his natural environment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to go through. I, so once again, I want you to remember positive expectancy and visualizing complexity so people make good decisions. That's the goal of all of this. But I'll show you different modes and different ways that it looks. So um, these are the things behind me are posters, and uh, which is different from graphic recording or graphic facilitation. This comes from uh, kind of like a TED-like conference where each speaker is given 12 to 18 minutes to share their mm. world-changing, amazing talent or research. Um, so in the back, each one of those colored pieces of paper is a poster. And I started to think differently. It's not about scribing. It's about how can I capture the essence of this person and or their message? So I started to think of them as uh, rock posters. Or uh, I, I studied in Poland and Russia and there's a great tradition of political posters and, and uh, just poster design. So 
So in that context, I set up a mobile art studio that's pretty messy. I got acrylic paints, that green bottle in the middle of Sumi ink, which is water soluble, but when it goes on paper and dries, it becomes um, like permanent ink and pastels. And so this is probably the most artistic mode is making these posters. And this is that little snippets of posters from this one three day conference. Um, so it, it's for me, that's real improv. I've never seen this person before. don't know what they're going to talk about. And I pull out images, uh, caricatures and metaphors and colors and quotes. This is like the high, uh, the most artistic and the higher, I wouldn't say higher, but the most, uh, yeah, this is not scribing. <laughs> and I'm showing this first as to set like one end of the continuum. Okay. Um, the other end is, um, and I'm doing more and more of this kind of work, which is not about a facilitated event, but it is about the creation of a large image, usually a timeline, um, is on chalkboard or whiteboard, working with a group to create a map. And so using post-it notes to map out ideas or incidents um, across this surface, and then coming in behind them and illustrating those different uh, items. Uh, so that's really cool is, is they're helping with the layout and the mm -hmm. content and then guiding me as I'm drawing. And it's, so it's not real time graphic recording. And the goal is this final product. So in this case, this was a, uh, a company, an office in California that designs offices in Silicon Valley. And they are a Herman Miller dealer and so they wanted to illustrate the whole history of their business and Herman Miller and design and how work has changed and in the environments of work have changed. Huh. Um, so similar to that is at uh, trade shows and larger conferences. So this is working in a booth at a, a healthcare conference and the people working the booth would invite people walking by so they weren't captive participants at a you know, a design session or a facilitative session, and and then asking them to add things to the timeline of healthcare and information, uh, informatics, the study of how we record information about health, going back to the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. And so once again, they would create post-its, so I'd come behind and illustrate, um, and then at the end, there was this big collaboratively designed piece. Cool. Um, yeah, it was really neat. People would come back throughout the three days to see the progress. And that gives them a real sense of ownership. You know, they put up one of their one post it or two post its and then they see it transform into art. Um, they take photographs of it. And so it's really engaging. Would you say that's like the lowest barrier to entry, like where people can put up a post it and then someone else turns it into art? Like that's the le least intimidating, but still form of engagement that you would you would say? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to for me to calibrate. Yeah, but um, yeah, it, it's um, it's just different. Yeah, they don't have to be there, so there's a lot of choice involved, which means they are they are choosing to spend time there, and and really understand what's going on. Um, but this is something we do in events where we have captive participants as well. <laughs> so, but I'm <laughs> I'm just sharing different ways that uh, the graphic facilitation is being used. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's uh, they recorded the whole thing and had news people there. Uh, that's me showing it off. And then, but this was the result. Is I was just three days of doing that, complete overwhelm. Mm -hmm. um, but you asked uh, a question that was similar to, you know, how do you get people started or involved? And it's through action. It's forcing them to draw. So usually, uh, when I'm doing a workshop on graphic recording skills, the first thing I'll do is the most terrifying thing for people, which is to sit down with one other human who they may or may not know and tell them, you need to draw a completely accurate portrait of this person, which is terrifying to do. And people have not attempted this, uh, or they've been to art school and they realize how hard it is. But um, right there, I, and I tell them this, I'm gonna make you do the hardest things that will maybe make you have an anxiety attack. After this, everything will be easy. Um, and, and the message there is, uh, is about detail, is to draw a human face 
um, you really you don't need that much detail. You just need enough to make it facey, you know, face-like. Uh, and with a few squiggles, we can get a lot of personality. Um, the other thing is that we are hardwired as humans to seek faces. And that's why when we look at rocks or clouds, um, we will see, you know, faces in them. And that's because our brain is wired to do that. So you don't need to give but a few cues. Um, and uh, one of the resources that I suggest to people is Austin Kleon's books. He has a whole series, but still of the womb ready to be awesome. You know, in reality, everybody stole like crazy, which is also known as learning, learning from other people and observing how they get that stuff done. So I have people look at emojis and comic books and uh, cartoons, teach them about um, cave art and we've been the fact that we've been doing this for tens of thousands of years uh, but once again we just need a little bit of detail and as facilitators where our primary tools are flip charts and whiteboards and post-it notes that's the trick is getting enough detail that's helpful without too much detail that's that's time consuming um, and I invite people to look everywhere look at artists and see how they draw people. And once again, uh, Keith Haring, who's one of the most famous artists from the 1980s, uh, you know, he stole from cave painting and, and looked at how artists around the world represented the human form. Yeah. Peter, so what specifically, so do you find that when you bring people up to that huge challenge right in the beginning of drawing, uh, drawing the human face that you're looking at of like an actual person in the room who's going to be judging you, you find that that is um, like your that is helpful in confronting that anxiety and shame people have around um, creating art, like that mm -hmm. trial by fire. You find that that works. Yes, I, I asked them, "What did you hear other people say the most?" And it's universally, it's "I'm sorry." So as people were drawing, you know, the other person there, you would apologize. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this one's not. And I'd point that out, say, we have a lot of shame inside of us and, and feelings of inadequacy. Really quick, can you switch back to your face just so that people like uh, can see you as you're, you're sharing this answer? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Go back to me. Yeah, I, I, uh, that aspect, like the fact that the people are constantly saying they're sorry, like that's what I was wondering would happen because that is such a... Um, I wouldn't even want to do that for someone that I love, let alone a stranger, right? You find that when you have people do that, uh, go on. Um, yes, so it, I call that out and I, I say, because most people who want to learn this skill, they want to learn it because they're working with other people. They aren't studio artists that are off by themselves. They are nurses, teachers, coaches, facilitators, whoever. Um, and they want to use this way of visual thinking and communication in order to help them with their job of connecting with other people. So I teach, I just call that out. It's not that I teach them. I say, you know, you've probably felt a lot of shame and anxiety. Well, everybody you're working with feels shame and anxiety about something. And it might be whatever you're asking them to do. Uh, and just know that, you know, be aware of that and, and gentle with each other um, and give them permission. So the way I've learned to, uh, I was taught this by somebody else is whenever you hear that voice that says you're a total imposter. You know, you're standing up in the front of the room, you're talking, people are looking at you, but you don't know what you're doing. That's that little devil or whatever on your shoulder that's saying that, is to take your hand and go like that and physically flick it. And um, which sounds so hokey, but I will force people to do that when they're whining to me. They're like, I can't do this, I'm not. I said, have you taken care of that voice on your shoulder? And there's something in doing that, you know, making your body, uh, disrupt the pattern that helps people move on. Peter, I'm wondering what, so I'm sure this is intentional. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what your thought process was like, why start with the hardest thing people are going to do rather than like, I want you all to just draw a square, like, you know, like just draw a square and like put eyes in it and a smiley face. Look, you draw a face, right? Like there are so many different ways we could start a, a workshop. What, have you always like did you always know that this is like how you wanted to start or like what's your intention behind like we're going to start highest bar and it's it's i'm not going to lose people it's going to be the right move well 
So I've tried that. That's what I used to do was have people draw a perfect circle and uh, come up and always they'd come up and the circle would look like a kind of rotted orange where there's a nice curve on this side and then kind of gets wiggly. And I have, I point that out. I said, this first part, you weren't even thinking about it. You were letting your body draw the circle. As you got here to the middle, you started to say, uh Oh, I got to make this perfect. And then you, were freaking out and thinking too much about it. So I used to start there. And then I just found that if I talk about shame and anxiety first through the, the portrait thing and show that we all have different artistic levels, um, then bring them back to the basic body mechanics of how to hold your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder when you're at a large vertical surface. Um, it's a little bit manipulative. I know that once we've done the face thing, they will gladly listen to any tips I give them. <laughs> your buddy in my hand. So it's, it's a little bit about compliance, but mostly it's about um, putting them in a, a moment of failure, in their minds, failure, because the level of perfection is infinite. We have all of art history on our shoulders. And uh, I tell them, we're going to do the hardest thing first, then go back to the easiest thing, so that you know this is not about art. It's not about perfection. It's about learning simple tools that help you move quickly, efficiently, to create visuals that help your audience connect with ideas. That's it. And so we get rid of that first. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is I... I, I'm trying to put myself in that setting. I've never been through a training like this, but I think that if you, if I went through it the other way, I would keep thinking like, as you did like a simple face, or as you did like, let's do a car. It's just two circles in a box or whatever it might be. I'd keep thinking like, oh gosh, this is going to keep getting harder. And the anxiety that I would experience would increase. And my, like my prediction of feeling shame would increase. Is that something even is, so does this help? prevent that. It's like, let's just, we know there's going to be anxiety and shame. Let's peak them right in the beginning. Yep. Um, okay. Um, in terms of straight facilitation, yeah. uh, I've found that that's helpful as well to just get everybody's fear and anger out first so that it's not in the back of people's minds. So even having them not draw, but write up on the board, you know, what's your number one fear for this project or what's going on here? or to even shout it out and have somebody scribe it and make a mind map or a bubble diagram or put it on post notes. Doesn't matter what the tool is, but to get it out so everybody sees it and say, we're, this is what we're bringing into the room. <laughs> yeah. All these fears, and then do the same thing for hopes um, and all these hopes. That's our, this, this is what's gonna carry us forward. This is what's gonna hold us back. So once that's acknowledged, it's not sneaking in the bushes ready to sabotage every idea that comes out. Yeah. And, is there any way that, oh, sorry, Sam. Um, so is there any way that you warm up a room to do that activity? Cause I like, I always have like so many ways I want to start and I, I never really know where to start. Like to me, I would love to start with like hopes and fears and believe people are going to actually share real ones. And maybe it's because like I I do a lot of like social justice facilitation, which like people have a ton of anticipation about. Um, but you know, it, like you said, we all have been told like you're not a good artist and you can't draw. So like, there's a ton of anticipation there. So is there anything you do to warm up a room before you do hopes and fears, or are you just like, listen, we gotta do this. So like, let's start there. Yeah, I don't walk in the room and say, hey, everybody, sit down now. Give me your darkest fears. <laughs> yeah, there is. There's, okay, so I shouldn't do that anymore. Okay. Yeah, well, um, so here are a couple of activities that are common in the facilitation world I live in. Um, after whatever intro and, you know, here's why we're here and here's what we're doing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, just the tradition I've come out of, you know, learning facilitation, we will get everybody up at a whiteboard or flip chart blank with a set of questions and invite them you know, create your model of either the future of what's possible or the, uh, you know, the current system. It kind of doesn't matter, but give everybody a blank surface. Like in a large room or if you don't have wall surfaces, you can do that with just printer paper, you can have by 11 pieces of paper. And so that everybody starts, it's very democratic. Everybody's got a blank sheet of paper. Everybody has the same 
question or questions, and everybody's got 20 minutes to create their personal vision. And then um, to allow them to be heard so that in groups of, even if it's dyads or triads or a small group of four people, five people, uh, everybody gets a chance to share whatever they want about their vision to an audience without criticism and without somebody making helpful suggestions. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. It's like, your only job is to listen. You can ask a question if you don't quite understand, but don't ask that question. That's not really a question. It's a, you know. Yeah. So, and that takes uh, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And then you've allowed every single person who's there a chance at a blank slate to create their vision, to share it with an audience, and then to express whatever is inside of them, and then be receptive. So that helps accomplish that. And then to post it, say, here's all of our visions. There, there's a lot of overlap, there's some differences, but it's undeniable. This is what all of us in here are thinking about. And then you can use that to synthesize a common vision or model within that small group. Um, and begin that process of iteration, iteration, iteration throughout the event, whether that's a two-hour meeting or a three-day facilitated session. That's great. Yeah, that that makes so much sense, Peter. And I'm, you know, a couple of times you've said things that have cued me into this um, concept that Meg and I have talked about a lot, which is so we, we wrote this book about the magic of facilitation, but we also joke a lot about the dark magic of facilitation. Those are like the, the as you mentioned earlier, like part of it's compliance, but part of it's also, um, I think it'll be helpful for them. Like you've found ways to um, like essentially trick participants in ways that are helpful for them as participants. So we refer to that as dark magic. Um, are there other things that you do that you would think of as being similar to that that you find really helpful that are like benevol benevolently manipulative that um, you'd like to share with us? Well, it's a, uh, yeah, <laughs> manipulative. Well, it's about process. So you're, you're, you have a goal in mind, which is to get a group of individuals to think as an organism uh, to produce something of value. Um, so these are, this is the stagecraft of facilitation. Uh, it's similar with a chiropractor or a doctor or a therapist is they're you call them manipulations they're ways to help the body move in order to help the body perform same with mental or social interactions um so music is huge uh the tradition of facilitation i came out of the environment itself is a facilitator so it, we think about everything lighting chairs, plants, natural light, uh, toys, color, um, and that can meet resistance from your client based on the world they live in. Um, because this is a theory of mine, the higher up an individual goes in the food chain of management or education or social justice or whatever, the greater the fear of looking stupid or silly in front of their peers or their bosses or their constituents. So it's, which I think is interesting. It's not the fear of getting it wrong. It's the fear of looking of perceived frivolousness. And so I know that. So when I go in and people say, hey, we don't want all that touchy filly to kumbaya stuff. Say, <laughs> Do you want people to trust each other? and think creatively, yes. You want people to uh, be free of any friction so that they can easily move from one activity to another, yes. If we want those things, then I, we have learned that the envi environment can facilitate that process. That's why we do it. So I think as facilitators, I, I know that myself being, when I was a younger facilitator, it's the same with any craft, let's say cooking, you can see somebody do it and you can mimic what you see, but if you don't know the why or the technique, you can really cause some damage. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, I'm saying that not to inhibit anybody, but just to say, you know, ask, if you're working with a facilitator or you're seeing somebody who's really effective, ask those why questions. Why did you choose to do that? That's what your whole purpose in this facilitation XYZ is, right? It's to ask the why, you know, what's What's the model behind the behavior? 
I don't know how I got on that, but yeah. I did. <laughs> dark magic. It was a helpful. It, it doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, dark art. That was it. Dark art. Yep. Dark magic. So I think you. Wait, I have one other thing to add. Music. Okay. Music. So music is a facilitator as well, and playing good, appropriate music at all times um, helps with behavior. What? what is, what's yeah. Appropriate music. Well, when people are reading or talking together, it's. It's music that has a 120 beat, one, uh, 120 beats per minute max, uh, and no words. That means, you know, classical, uh, light jazz, whatever. Um, but it, it's the it's a music bed upon which higher level thinking, reading, conversation can happen. If it's hey everybody, we got to move, you know, that's when you want house music, rock and roll. To, and it's about pattern interrupts. So you want to set the appropriate patterns for the music is saying, now it's time to work versus now it's time to move versus now it's time to get started in the morning versus now it's time to get serious. Uh, it's just like a movie. The music sets the tone for the what's about to happen next. Is there any inappropriate music? Inappropriate. Well, like, well, music like, like, steer clear of. Steer clear of. <laughs> no, I just came from an event where one of our members is uh, blackballed. He's blacklisted from doing uh, music because he will always default to show tunes. And uh, <laughs> so that's, and he says, that's the world I live in. I don't know any other music. I'm like, yes, but the Book of Mormon is not the appropriate. <laughs> They're too divisive They're too to play. Divisive. We're getting some. If anybody's seen some the Book of Mormon, you know what I'm talking about. I, yeah. I, I love yeah. It. I love it. It's it's great. Great. But the lyrics themselves will is a career limiting move if you've been brought in to facilitate a group of uh, bankers. Yeah. So Peter, yeah. So, Peter, intense feedback. Oh, okay, yeah. So I was going to do that too, Sam. Thanks. So Peter, we're getting some really intense feedback when me and Sam talk. You are great. You're perfectly clear. But when we talk, it's echoing in yours. So two solutions, two possible solutions. First would be uh, you could put in headphones and see if that takes care of it. The second would be just like when we talk, um, if you could mute yourself. Um, but either way, we'll see if the headphones solution it up. Um, I love that you have those there. All right. You check this. I have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you for some reason. I don't know why that's a feature, but it yeah. is. All right. Let's see All if right. that works. Seems like it worked. OK, cool. Yeah, so no show tunes, um, and specifically no potentially R-rated show tunes. That's good to know. Oh, uh, um, also, you know, we have used Spotify a lot. And sometimes you put on a playlist, and then some hardcore uh, hip hop uh, R-rated lyrics start coming on to. But it, the point is, you know, it's purposeful. It's curated, like anything else, is uh, make choices as to, to how to use music as a facilitation tool. Yeah. Sure. One question I have, Peter, is um, so I've I've only done this once, and I thought it was really helpful. But I'm starting to feel like this will be something I do more regularly. Is I had a a client take like I was like, hey, I would love to see the space I'm facilitating in. Can we FaceTime me into the space? And like I can, and I was like, oh my god, like all of a sudden I have so many new ideas of like what's going to be problems and what are going to be like possible solutions. What are the ways that you like? ask questions or get to know a space before you're in there? And then like, are there any space deal breakers for you? Like, are there any where you're like, I know that you want these things. I can't do that in this space. Like, it's not possible. Um, it, the answer is yes, there are. I, yeah, it's design constraints. And mm -hmm. that's how I frame it is uh, what, what, are, what are the opportunities and constraints of the space versus good space, bad space? And so if doing a highly visual interactive workshop where we want all participants to produce and be able to see them uh, on the walls, it is a, it's, an in, it's a positive thing to have a lot of wall space that we can use. And those can be windows, blank walls, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's a tough, that's a tough one, but that, that's how I frame it is, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities and then just be real upfront is like, if you want 30 people to work in a windowless conference room for eight, a six hour session, 
uh, we have to think about oxygen levels. We have to think about you know, cognition and metabolism. Uh, if we're going to feed them lunch and then have them watch PowerPoint presentations until 2 o'clock. These are things that just, there's this left brain thinking and then there's the humanity thinking of, we all, I think in the world of problem solving, we want to design agendas based on the assumption that we can receive all information without losing it, process it rationally, and then work really hard to build a lot of stuff. Um, but in the end, we have this meat suit that we wear that has metabolism and feelings and emotions and oxygen levels. So I, I just talk about that. Like, and then, and then uh, if I have to really tell somebody this is not going to work, is just say, well, um, you know, I, from my experience and other uh, events I've seen, here are some horror stories. Here's where it went wrong. How do how do you feel we could address that? Um, in the end, it goes back to that fear of looking silly or stupid in front of your boss. People will do what they've seen because that's accept the accepted pattern. And another way to phrase it is one of the values of facilitation is we're interrupting the normal pattern. And that's part of the creative process as well as we're trying to disrupt the normal way of working in order to stimulate new ways of thinking and working together. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, Peter, you, you mentioned earlier the, uh, I guess some of the things that people, uh, some of the things that people might do wrong when it, when it relates to like the cooking example that you brought up, like you see someone cooking and you think, oh, okay, so it's just about those spices in that order or whatever it might be. And then you go and you try to make the dish and it comes out completely wrong. What are some things that you've seen graphic facilitators do um, maybe who are newer to the field or maybe people who don't have any sort of training that are just like common, like rookie mistakes that would be so easy to avoid if someone were told like, hey, actually just like don't use that marker or don't use that color or don't, whatever it might be. What are some like rookie mistakes you see that are really common? Uh, the, once again, the career limiting one is putting up one sheet of paper on a nice white wall and then using a big juicy Sharpie and then taking down that paper and seeing that it's covered with your drawing on that nice wall surface. So that's, that's pretty mud. It's pretty so basic, but the giant, when you're doing the giant sticky notes, you do two at a time. Yeah. It's just be aware if you're using a big juicy permanent marker, you want to protect your surface. So that's the one. Um, but in terms of uh, capture is um, the analogy I use is, uh, you're, you come to a, a big rushing river and you have to get across it. And there are a couple ways to get across it safely. One is to build a giant dam and try to stop all the water. And the scribing or graphic recording type of way to do that is slowing everybody down, saying, hold on, let me get that, let me get that, let me get that. That's where if you're one person trying to facilitate and capture, it's a challenge. So use your audience. Um, if, if you are a solopreneur or solo facilitator, um, ask somebody else to help capture, to facilitate, you know, okay, we're going to get everybody's hopes and fears or whatever the topic is. I'm going to record. I'm going to ask Sam to volunteer to just manage that. So to not be afraid to include people in that. And then also using sticky notes so you can have people write the word down, hand it to your volunteer collector, and then you transcribe it up there. So that's one way to manage that process. Um, so back to the river analogy, if you're doing graphic recording and you can't slow down the process, you just need to pay attention to the big words, big themes. And that's the equivalent of looking for stepping stones across the river. Because in the end, if somebody's presenting a PowerPoint and they have 85 slides with charts, graphs, bullet point lists. My assumption is the participants can get access to that. What the scribing needs to do is capture the big ticket items, big themes, if questions come out that aren't on the slides. And so just pay attention to the big things. And then the, <clears throat> the third uh, part is think of hierarchy of information. So what's your big title, your subtitle, and your content? And um, and it, if you are 
beginning to experiment with this and you don't consider yourself really strong in drawing is just experiment with the simplest of icons because uh, even a little stick figure or a star or, a, or an arrow that helps your viewer navigate the content. And that's your job. You're, you're producing, you're capturing content and then you're helping people to navigate. So you don't have to set really high expectations for your visualness of it. Um, but neat handwriting will get you a long way. <laughs> Writing in all caps. And do um, and you want to learn the secret to scribing? This is, the, this is worth thousands of dollars. Do it. Lock your wrist when you're writing and write with your elbow. So when, when you're writing in a journal, we use fine motor, motor skills up here in the fingers um, and a little bit of the wrist. And that's what most people do when they're on a flip chart. So you see this handwriting that looks like just, it looks like a bumblebee dragged a pen across there, you know. So if you lock your wrist and you draw with your elbow, it does two things. One, it forces you to draw with real clear lines. Secondly, the weight of your arm presses into the surface. So it forces a bold stroke which is easy to read from the back of the room. And then if you uh, lock your wrist, draw with your elbow, it forces you to maybe draw in block letters. So that's the other thing is write in block letters. Uh, that right there will separate you from your participants. They'll think, wow, you have the best handwriting ever. And you're just like, I'm just writing in all caps in big strokes. Um, but it, this is what helps. Yeah. Um, I think it's, once again, it's a form of, I don't know how to articulate it, but I see that senior leaders, they don't want to write stuff down and they're thinking too fast. So that's where the bumblebee scribble scrabble comes through. And in my mind is like, why even write something down if you are writing something that can't be understood? This is a, a really detail-y question, but I love flip charts and I love like, I don't love PowerPoint. Um, basically, and I want to use like flip charts and write things as people are talking for any size group. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's always possible. Like I think it's, there is some kind of, I don't know, there's some like spatial, right, of just like, I can't read that no matter how big you're writing and it's unreasonable for me to write like one, uh, you know, one idea per flip chart so that people in the back can see. Do you have any like, this is kind of the max amount of people I'll do the whole flip chart thing with, or the max size room, um, or like, is there any in between PowerPoint and flip chart that you like have navigated where you can do something live, but still do it with a big group where they're supposed to read it in that moment, like not a not a recording session, but something where they they you want them to be able to see it in that moment. Um, um, you, you, big, big. Oh, I'm oh, getting it now. now. Uh, uh, big. big uh, post-it notes with a bold sharpie so you know this size post-it note you can write very quickly and slap on a flip chart um, and then have somebody else manage that paper so you could ask for a volunteer so that people aren't waiting for you to rip the paper off and walk it over there uh, like I said use your participants as much as possible uh, because it is two different roles, facilitating a conversation and recording a conversation. Second thing is to build templates. Template being we have a big circle. That's our big uh, whatever is coming in, our inputs. These are the things we want to focus on. Triangle is these are our action items. So that you allow the template to have nature hates a void. So if people hate a template with a blank field in it. So you can use the template to help guide production uh, of the content and to help you with transitions. Say, oh, well, our circle full of inputs is full. Uh, any last one before we move on to what we're going to work on today? That's the square that we're filling up. Is that helpful? So helpful. Uh, and I love the um, the people. If you saw me shaking my head, I was it was in a like emphatic yes sort of way, where I was just like, ah, oh, so good. Um, <laughs> but I love the template of like people hate a void because I think that's so real, right? Like it's in the same way that like if you wait long enough, people will answer the question because they don't want to sit in silence more than they want to answer. Like 
that that seems like the visual facilitation equivalent, right? Like you draw a circle and say, we should fill this circle. People will be like, we will fill the circle. Like yeah. we will. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. And Peter, have you experimented much or has seen much success in experimenting with digital forms of capture in live facilitations? Is that something that you, you've done? And yeah, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, so I'll just show you what the output looks like. Cool. Yeah, please. And, and for me, it is, it is a brave new world. So let me get to this little part here. And then I'll show my screen. OK. 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 So all of these visuals were made on an iPad. Um, in a program called Paper. OK, yeah, I have that program. Yeah, I like it because it's limited. It's a limited palette. They've calibrated all the colors so they all work together, no matter what color you use. So I've made a keynote just, or a PowerPoint, using the iPad to create the content. And so this is a presentation that I use to talk about neuroscience and how people learn. Okay. Um, but it's all created on the iPad and then just export it as a JPEG and put into a presentation. So this is an example of something I, that I produced before okay. an event and then used as a presenter. Okay. And, and would you, what, mm -hmm. could you see that, um, that similar process um, being useful in like a real time setting? Or do you think that that gap between the exporting as JPEGs and, um, or, or would there be a way to do it without that? Like, I, I, I'm, this is also like kind of Meg's question, a very detailed one. Like, I don't know about a way to um, get an iPad feed into a projector. I don't know if that's if there's a way to do that through a dongle or anything. But um, this is cool. I mean, it's 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 a beautiful way to make slides. I wonder if you could do that in like a live to. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to show you um, what that looks like right now. So I'm going to. Oh, sweet. Here, gotta switch my screen somehow. <laughs> stop sharing. Share again. We can see your face now. <laughs> All right. Uh, your entire. I'll just switch to my entire screen. Okay. Let me know when you can see what looks like an iPad at yes. an event. Okay. Yep. All right, so this was a huge conference at uh, the Gaylord in Dallas, which is a giant facility. Um, so it was a roughly 4,000 person event. Okay. And this is in the plenary session. I'm working on an iPad Pro. And um, so that's, that's what it looks like. And in the back of the house, they had an Apple TV. So this iPad could connect to the Apple TV, which just became an input uh, for the screen. So I was able to broadcast directly to the Jumbotron. Cool! <laughs> yeah, from the audience. So I was producing this in the audience while the speaker was talking. So and that's the airport or, or whatever. Uh, airport. Apple TV. Uh, but you can hardwire in with a HDMI dongle uh, directly to the iPad. OK. So there, there are a lot of different connectors that are available. And the new iPad Pro has this swanky pin that's yeah. super responsive. So it, the output does look just like if I was drawing with a marker or a paintbrush. So this was uh, live scribing for former Dallas quarterback Roger Staubach as in the 1970s. Um, and they would move. They would. They being the production team would um, switch the switch between the live feed, the camera feed of the presenter. In this case, he did not have slides, and then transitioned back to my scribing. So cool. for the audience, it's like watching a tennis match. You know, oh, the <laughs> speaker said this. How did they capture it there? Oh, cool. Look how it got captured there. And then afterwards, I was able to email this to the social media team that then live posted it on their blog for the conference and tweeted it out. So the benefit was it was already digitized, and by coordinating with the whole facilitation and production team, they could disseminate that that visual and that content and use it on those different platforms: the yeah. website, Twitter, Instagram, 
and then live in in the uh, in the in the event. Cool. That's so cool. Um, and this is what this is an example of just text only. I drew a cowboy hat, but it was going so fast. Um, all I did was use different colors for the text. You had some basic icons I can see in there. Yeah. Meg, this is another idea for your flip chart conundrum. Yeah. Is just even having two markers, maybe three color markers. So at yeah. least you're moving around colors and it's not all one color. So even if you have different colors, it's just easier for people to filter and navigate. Cool. Yeah. And then that's another view of how it looked uh, in the live show. And a lot of my friends are doing the same same thing, this live cool. digital scribing. That's neat. That is, yeah, and that's basically, I, I had a hunch that that was totally doable. And <laughs> I love that we just saw a Trump slide. My my gut was just like, hmm, uh, and moving on. Uh, nobody has to guess my political views. I think they're quite obvious. Um, <laughs> well, they, this was the favorite image from that conference. This was a consumer banking association. And none of this is proprietary or secret or for one company, but they were talking about student lending. And this image had everybody in there. It had Dracula, uh, Bernie Sanders, Trump, uh, it's Lamar Alexander, Secretary DeVos, uh, Frankenstein, <laughs> the, the bill the from uh, Schoolhouse Rock, and a that cobra. Uh, yeah, that's, I, I think that's great. That's beautiful. Um, uh, okay. But I, I want, real quick, I wanted to point another thing out. This is only two colors. So also for, for beginning yeah. scribes, if you just stick to black and a highlight color, you can accomplish a lot. Good tip. Um, that's awesome. Peter, do you want to come back to your face? <laughs> back to my beautiful furry face. Yeah. <laughs> So switch gears a bit, Peter. I'm curious if you could talk about what you think um, facilitators who don't use graphic facilitation, graphic reporting, recording, facilitators who maybe don't use visuals at all, like maybe even not flip charts. Um, what are some things that uh, non-visual facilitators could learn from visual facilitators? I like that, non-visual facilitators, uh, which is ironic because the most visual thing is you. You know, you as the facilitator up at the front of the room, gesturing, making faces, using your voice. I mean, that's, you are a visual facilitator. Um, so. Well, yeah, and actually speak to that a little bit because I, I don't think that, so one of the other guests that we talked about really mentioned, uh, who's, was it? Uh, um, Jamie? No, but anyway, one of our other guests, and I'll remember it as soon as I, I stopped trying to think about it, mentioned like how important your your presence is, your physical presence is. And I hadn't thought really, yeah, I saw them, it was Solomon and Masala. Um, mentioned that, and Peter, can you speak to that idea? Like, that, that's your the first thing that popped in your head. Like, um, in what ways might people be visually presenting in um, ways that aren't helpful to what they're trying to do through their 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 physical self? Well, I'm not going to bash anybody for being unhelpful, especially because my sense of fashion has gotten so much criticism from the <laughs> people in my life. They're like, "You're wearing that to facilitate." <laughs> so. Um, and, and I'm a big cartoon physical comedy guy. So when I'm facilitating, it's more like watching your drunk uncle at a family gathering than, you know, well, well poised professional. <laughs> so uh, I think most important is um, authenticity being, being yourself. And secondly is being willing to share stories. And I think anybody who ends up in this field is a is a natural facil uh, storyteller, or is interested in connecting, understanding people's stories and connecting to them. So um, just learning more about how to be a good storyteller. We do it already verbally, so we use a lot of visual language and metaphors in the way we describe things, and um, and then. Going back to Austin Kleon's book, Steal Like an Artist, is watch what other people are doing. Is There's so many resources out there to use. Uh, choose your own and one that you like. Um, I think the most deadening presentations I see are the ones that are built like they should be built. And once again, that gets back to the fear factor is if I can't 
make it interesting. At least I'll make it safe. Um, and my, I've learned this teaching kids. So when I went to Poland, I did not speak Polish, and I was given a classroom of 30 children, ages 8 to 15. Some were non-native speakers. Most did not speak any English. And it was an after-school program. Uh, so it was a rowdy bunch. I did not speak Polish. All different age groups, all different levels. And so I set the bar really low, and I've continued with the same philosophy. The bar is anybody who's there, I'm going to let them know that while they're there, I'm not going to let anybody hurt them. And it's a safe place. Secondly is we're going to have fun. Anything above that where it gets into learning is a bonus. So if I let people know that it's a safe place, I'm not going to hurt them. I'm not going to let anybody else hurt them. And we're going to have fun. That's, that's my personal baseline. So as a facilitator, it's just knowing your personal baseline. But uh, Meg, you work in social justice, and you know that there's, you know, there's high emotion and there's a lot of trauma. And so I think that safety is so important uh, in any, any context. I, there's a lot of fear in the corporate world. You know? and people can be gone like that. And so um, that's why I kind of throw myself under the silly bus is I'll be the most ridiculous person in the world in the room. You don't have to worry about that. You can make fun of me, but um, I'll make it safe for you to draw, to share your ideas, to dream big, um, to be human. Um, and we're not going to let anybody hurt you while you're there. Right. Um, so I think those three things. So to play that back, it was be yourself, be authentic, know what your baseline is um, and make it a safe place for other people to be themselves. I think that's great. All of the rest of this stuff, drawing, facilitation techniques, doc art, I think that's what it's designed to do is to create that safe space. Hmm. Peter, if so I don't, I am at the place of my, like, so how visual my workshops typically get is like reasonably OK flip chart, like bullets. That's, that's the level. And if I, if you were like, okay, if, if I, if I was to sit down with you for another call and this would be a longer conversation, but I'd love to like, just get five seconds now. Um, and I was like, how can I take what I'm doing and infuse some of what you're doing into it? Like, do you have any like quick tips or like easy starting places for me to start using visual tools or visual facilitation in like what I'm already doing? Um, do you have anything that comes to mind not knowing my content that you're just like, these are some things you can do right off the bat? Uh, yeah. I will go back to, uh, can I show something? Sure. Real quick? OK. And, I, and then I have some resources that I would point anybody to. All right. OK. So this is the work of Dave Gray. He's the founder of Explain. And he's spent his life in information design and then helping businesses figure out what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at, you now Dave's a really accomplished designer and artist, but this is an example of how he uses figures and creates a model. So I would encourage you to experiment with models. And models are very simple. They just have shapes, circle squares, triangles, characters, which you can have just a circle and another shape for a human and annotation and titles. So th this is an example from Dave of, of how teams work together. And it's, it's really simple. I think some people would look at this and be intimidated. But if you, you break it down, um, it's just got a couple of things going on. It's got these simple icons. And once again, there's so many resources out there that you can pull from as clip art um, and then practice drawing or just you know use that clip art, but just icons, symbols. And the difference between those two is an icon is a is an image that looks like the thing it represents. Mm -hmm. And a symbol is an image that requires uh, cultural knowledge or meaning. Got so you have, to, you have to be taught what the symbol means. Um, and then metaphors are, we use those linguistically 
to connect people to abstract ideas or unfamiliar ideas through concrete images. You know, the elephant in the room, thinking outside the box, blue sky thinking, blah, blah, blah. So between icons, symbols, and metaphors, you know, play around with those. But uh, who I would, the book I would recommend is um, Mike Rohde's Sketch Note Handbook. And there's a lot of great how to's in there about uh, typography, writing, icons, simple images. Mm -hmm. And where he distilled that from was his own moleskin notebooks. He just was, he's a UX designer by training. So he helps people design uh, websites and apps. And he started going to conferences. And he, at first, he was taking notes linearly, like most people do. And it was going too fast. So then he just started playing around with writing big words and then big words and simple sketches. And so his book, uh, Sketch Notes, teaches those simple techniques. Yeah. Can I ask a, a follow up question that may or may not be a visual thing? So we like we uh, were chatting with a facilitator earlier in the week and they gave a really simple model that I found like really powerful, which was this idea of a list of things, you know, and a list of things you wonder. And I was like, wow, like my brain just went like, bam, like I have like a lot of ideas of ways I could use that. Are there any, like you were saying, like a circle over here and a triangle over here, right? And use the like, one is for what we're doing already and one is for like action. Are there any other like really little tools that you would like just never leave, <laughs> never leave home without? Like that's not a phrase that makes sense in this case, but do you know what I mean? Like where you're like, I pull this one out like, you know, 75% mm -hmm. of the time and it, it makes a big like visual impact or it, and it just makes the process easier. Um, that would probably be some sort of mind mapping. So, okay. um, yeah, and that helps get away from the linear list mm -hmm. and it allows nonlinear conversations. So the simplest mind map is you have whatever the topic is in the middle with a circle around it. And then you draw to the next topic and what's related to that. And then the next topic, no, let's come back to this topic. It allows that kind of ping pong. Yeah. But then it results in a in a diagram where you see what's connected to what. So that's that that's what I use all the time while scribing is I'll just put whatever the title of the presentation is in the middle and then just start working off of that. But the mind map is there's a formal way to do it, which maybe many people who are watching this know, where you have this kind of root system, and then there's just bubble diagrams. You know you. You write a topic, draw a circle, connect it to something else. So that's 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 my go-to. Great. That's great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, are there any other things that, that come to your mind? So it, it's um, when you're as a visual facilitator and you're trying to communicate with maybe other facilitators, are there things that you see that people uh, misunderstand about your work that if they understood better, they might better understand their work? Um, or things that like ways that you think other facilitators could benefit from the expertise that you have. That's something that we're really interested in in this project is how so many facilitators get siloed, but we would really benefit more from community uh, across those silos. So there, are there other things that pop into your mind? The, the things you've been sharing have all been really helpful. Um, can you ask the short version of that? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, what's what's something else, or what's one thing that pops in your mind that um, non-visual facilitators would benefit from that you do really well, or that visual facilitators as a whole do really well? Um, and you can interpret that however you'd like. But is there anything else that comes into your mind beyond the things that you've already shared? Uh, well, the, going back to an earlier theme, it's not thinking of this as art or as making the content pretty. You know, it's, uh, it's the more that the graphic recording can be incorporated into the facilitation process, the better, um, and, the, and the richer that relationship is. So as a graphic recorder, sometimes it's a, it's a luxury to just parachute in and not have been a part of the whole process and just listen and record. But 
for a facilitator, myself included, I don't like to facilitate alone. I like to have a team. And even if that team is, um, is in quote, invisible. So there's the front of the room facilitation. There might be the, the side of the room facilitation with the graphic note taker, the graphic recorder, whatever term you want to use it. And then there's the back of the room facilitation, which might be your clients. It might be somebody else on your team that's helping manage the space, uh, producing assignments or capturing the content. But the more that we can have conversations as a team of what it, what's the process that the participants are going through um, to include a graphic recorder in the early morning, we call it a circle up. It's just whatever the standing meeting is before participants come in, and then the debrief afterwards. That's where real learning takes place. Um, I was just at an event uh, for a corporate client where there was just none of that, you know, and that was fine. I was used to it, but it, but they just brought me in. They said, "You're over in the corner. Here's the agenda. Go." Uh, and at the end, I was like, "You know what? They they would have gotten a lot having just." had a little conversation with me or involved me in their debrief at the end of the day because a graphic recorder is much more than a hand. It's an ear and a brain who's listened to a lot of different conversations. So you I know, don't know if that answered your question, but oh, it totally did. And what I, I figured that whatever you said would work because you're saying so many things that are are um, just sparking different thoughts in my head. And one of the things that just popped into my mind is in a lot of uh, facilitation work that I've done, so in social justice facilitation or outdoor or experiential ed, or I used to work in like um, higher education, orientation for year programs, we often see the co-facilitators as being kind of like two of the same thing. Like we're gonna share the responsibility, um, we're gonna tag each other in and out when we need to share energy levels, or um, if somebody's struggling with a problem, I might jump in and help. But that idea of like, there are very different roles and there are very different functions that um, that can lead to or not lead to uh, a powerful experience for a group. And thinking about, you keep talking about using the participants as kind of like your other facilitator. That's not something that I often think about as a, as a resource. Um, and some uh, group of my friends that work at the Center for Sexual Pleasure and Health, they have this concept called the third whale. I don't know if y'all are familiar with this idea of third whale. No, so the third whale with some whales mating rituals, um, if there's not a third whale there to help, the, the whales will actually float apart during mating. So there's this third whale that without, it's just like a bro who comes in and it's like, hey, I got you, and just kind of like keeps bumping them together. Um, I literally got your back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and they, they use that in their facilitations as like another facilitator who's just there for like, do people need, um, oh, we, we don't have enough printouts or oh, there's this participant who's having this issue, or we need water, or you, you were talking earlier about like just the biological like metabolic necessities, right? Like maybe the room's too hot or too cold, just somebody there who can support the other two whales, which this is where the analogy gets kind of odd. Um, but well, go can ahead. I just on that, Sam? Yeah. Because one thing that I, I, I wrote down this phrase when you were talking, Peter, is like client as team. Like I sometimes am totally guilty of this where I will see the client, especially their check-ins in the morning and stuff, as like a barrier to what I'm doing. Like, hey, if you could just let me do my thing, this will go like I, I, I need to just do me like and do this up front. And like if you could just step back, that'd be really helpful. But I was feeling like a completely opposite energy from you, which I think would or that's what I was picking up was like you, you're like, yeah, you are part of my team and you are going to make this day go better with me. And I need you to like, you know, help me in these ways. And I might call on you in these and like, that to me just sounds both like more happy because they get to feel useful, you get to feel less burdened, and like just better client relationships, like all of that. Is that is that a fair uh, assessment of what you were saying, or just my own assessment? It is. And Meg, we don't know each other very well, but I'm going to call you out on some language. So you used a lot of me and you. So that also has that barrier. But when you shift the language to us and our and the team, and that just signals linguistically that it's not me and you, it's yeah. not facilitator and, and client. So um, the more that we can all do that, where it's us and we and ours and how do we move forward and all of that, uh, just that sets the pattern 
uh, that breaks down that separation. Um, and at the same time is reminding all of us that there are roles. So there's the role of the front of the room facilitation. So uh, we may need me to play that role. Um, but the tradition that I grew up in, uh, we tried really hard to make sure that people didn't become identified with the role, which is hard because when somebody's really great at, let's say, front of the room facilitation or graphic facilitation or uh, production or writing, we, we all want to, to succeed. And, and it really is difficult to learn in public. But that's where the strength comes from is if you have a team, even if it's a distributed team and people are moving into a role that's unfamiliar, they will learn and they'll get stronger. And even if they feel like they quote fail, they will have a greater appreciation for what goes into that role so that the next time they do that, they know how to, to be the third whale. So they know that, man, that's a lonely ass place at the front of the room. When you're a facilitator and you look out and you have people, important people who are paying money or have a lot at stake looking at you for what to do next, and you look back and maybe the two people on your team are gone because they ran to the bathroom or they're getting something ready, that's a lonely feeling. Yeah. Or if you walk into that den of wolves by yourself. So you don't know that until you've done it. And uh, so allowing people, even just for one activity, uh, let's say you have somebody new to facilitation whose primary role is production and making sure all the materials are there, the room's set up. Turn so, uh, the kickoff to an activity over to them. It'll help your audience because having somebody new at the front of the room uh, raises their level of attention. Oh, Meg's not talking anymore. Sam is. And you said, hey, Sam's going to introduce our next activity. And Sam, who may have been quiet in the back of the room getting everything ready, will suddenly be in a role of facilitating the next activity. Uh, and I think all of, all of that is really helpful. It, it turns us into an, a, a learning organization. You know, so we're, drink, we're taking our same medicine that we're trying to get our participants to do, which is to learn. Um, and uh, that's also how we prepare the next generation. Um, and that we learn how adults learn together. Because adults, we all as adults learn socially. Uh, kids do as well, but adults were, were more skittish about it. And so making it comfortable for adults to learn in public is, is a gift. Yeah, it is. Can and you know, the thing that I really appreciate about um, your, your work, Peter, and I don't know if you'd like to remark on this, but is that you are, you're not the, um, you are in no way a snake oil salesman in the sense of you are selling a product that you don't believe in yourself. You are using the thing, you are using the facilitation that you believe in, not just with the client, but in producing the client relationship and producing like your own internal work. You were talking about how you use it to take notes and all those things. And I know that for me, that's not something that I've ever even considered doing. Like when I'm planning a facilitation, um, I and it, let's say it's gonna be very experientially based, in no part of my planning am I forcing myself to have experiences and make meaning from those experiences and then from that meaning, like create the plans for the facilitation that will come. Um, a lot of what I do is, is helping people navigate discomfort in really healthy ways. I don't force myself to navigate discomfort in healthy ways when I'm planning those experiences. I'm incredibly intellectual when I'm planning the experiences. I'm using theory, et cetera. Um, and this is getting me thinking that y'all are like walking the talk and like living and breathing the work that you're doing. And that's gotta be so helpful. Can, can you speak to that at all? Or is, does that um, spark any thoughts? Uh, well, I, I have to go back and give credit to that first um, environment I, I staggered into in 1996. They, that's, they're the ones that modeled that behavior, was that uh, everything is a process. We have roles, um, but the, the process is about looking at a problem in different ways and iterating what we're doing next. And one of my gurus, uh, so I learned this in a facilitation process that came out of Matt and Gail Taylor, um, who they 
learned this and evolved it going back to the 60s and 70s um, to Buckminster Fuller and Frank Lloyd Wright. So this is like tradition and bits and pieces that have been handed on. And one of Gail's um, mantras is that all artists ship a product, which sounds very commercial, but the message is whatever conversation we have, uh, there should be an output from it. Whatever breakout group there is, whatever discussion we have, there should be a result. We should ship a product. It shouldn't, you know, in facilitation land and design land, it's not just sitting around shooting the shit. Excuse my language, but um, really or talking in circles. Uh, we should ship a product. And using even the simplest note taking or graphic facilitation produces a product that you can ship or iterate for something else. And so it just is a pattern and it's a it's a habit. That's great. Um, I have one final thing that I want to show that will help with the dark arts. <laughs> okay. Subtle great. manipulation. But yeah, the only the one thing that we want to make sure that we are able to do is we've got some some questions that we ask of all facilitators. So sure. can, if you show us that, then we can move into that final segment. Does that work? Yeah. Awesome. There's a, a little kindergarten neuroscience. Okay. So my kindergarten level understanding of, of neuroscience. All right. So, but uh, I think it's it'll be helpful. Uh, it's helped me. So this is a model that I show when I'm when I'm teaching about graphic facilitation. Uh, let me. Can you see this thing that says BA forty six? Yep. Okay. So uh, this is this is something that was really helpful. Is um, in facilitation and brainstorming and ideation design thinking, we go through these two different processes. On the left, starting with a question and doing divergent thinking, coming up with a lot of what ifs and how mights and how shoulds and all those big ideas. And then the second part is this convergent and eliminating options and iterating and trying to come out with a some sort of decision of what we're going to do next, right? So that's the simplest diagram of what we do as facilitators. Uh, this left side is important to get people to loosen up and think creatively. And all those dark, dark art techniques and facilitation techniques, I think, are designed to, to accomplish this. So there's a part of our brain, it's right over, the, it's on the left side of the brain, right above the ear, and it's the Broadman area 46. So the Broadman area is, is the map of the whole brain. So whoever this Broadman was, he <laughs> divided up the brain into all these different areas. So this Area 46 is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is the most recent part of the brain to evolve. Um, and it helps us with strategic planning, with theory of mind, getting inside somebody else's brain, planning for the future, uh, executive functions of, uh, of, you know, all the, we think of left brain, but it's really the prefrontal cortex that is the logical part of the brain. And so this is part of that. But it's, it's the part of the brain that helps us with impulse control and judgment, and it's closely associated with language. So damage to that part of the brain will um, impair a person's ability to speak in a way that conforms to social norms. And it's the judge, the referee part of our brain. So it's the one that's constantly saying, is this appropriate? It, should I do it? Should I not? You know. Now the goal of artists, actors, and uh, improv artists of any form is to turn that off. So the goal in art and especially in improv activities like jazz or improv acting or painting is to follow rules and to, to adhere to structure while limiting the effect of that referee part of the brain. And the way that musicians and actors and artists do that is by exercise and practice. And so that the body is in motion and it's conforming to these different patterns and structures, but in a free form way. And that's, so that's why in, if you ever take a theater class, especially improv, you'll do all these crazy exercises to turn off that prefrontal, that part of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and that's why all the, the icebreakers work. I never knew that, right? We see these icebreakers and warm up exercises and they're kind of hokey, but if they're done right, they loosen people up. And now I, I have language to help explain that to clients like, hey, 
We need people to think rationally and logically, but we need them to be creative. The first part of this process is going to be an opening up divergent process. In order to get people ready for that, we need to do this icebreaker that helps people practice with uh, responding in real time in a relaxed way so that later on they can be really logical and focused in a different way. And so I've started using that in the early part of the facilitation uh, design with clients to validate all these creative activities. The unfortunate thing is if I'm working with fifth graders, I don't have to do any of that bullshit. We just start. But <laughs> once you have you know, people that have master's degrees, MBAs, PhDs, director titles, I have to validate what we know already works with a little bit of that theory. But isn't that cool? I mean, that's that yeah. this stuff, the stuff that facilitators use well works because it's designed for the way our brains work and the way our bodies work. That's great. Thank you. That's awesome. <clears throat> okay. So Peter, we're gonna transition into the last segment of our uh, of the show. And we, like Sam mentioned, we have a couple of questions. We have about 10 questions, not, not a couple as in two, but like a couple as in 10 um, <laughs> questions for you. And I'll try to be brief. <laughs> we asked, hard. yeah, so we ask these of all of our guests. And our goal is basically at some point we might do a, a video where it's like the question and then we get everybody's different inputs. So just know like that's kind of the context in which we are going to ask the questions. And we will not do any follow-up. So you might say something that like gets me and Sam really jazzed, but we're gonna do uh, our best to bite our tongue and write that down for a, a later conversation. So it's like the actor's studio? Uh, no, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. What's your favorite curse word? <laughs> <laughs> that's we don't have that one. We could add it though. <laughs> Uh, okay. okay. So with that said, the first question is, what are the three words that you would use to describe facilitation? Now I have curse words in my mind. <laughs> yeah, you primed that. Um, real time, experiential, terrifying. Awesome. If you could pick one ground rule and apply it to the entire world and everyone would have to follow it, what would it be? Uh, more jazz hands. <laughs> what is something that you still need to be reminded of as a facilitator? Stop talking. Nice. What do you do right before a facilitation? Uh, oh, uh, circle up with my team and do some sort of high five. What do you do right after? Same thing. Yeah? Awesome. What is a piece of facilitation advice you'd like to give your five-year-ago self? Uh, yeah, don't try to be too serious. Um, what still stresses you out as a facilitator? Looking out at a crowd of smart people who are staring back at me, expecting me to know what to do next. And how do you manage that stress? Um, by finding the one sympathetic person in the crowd and making eye contact with them. So real. Yeah, that's such a good tool. Uh, what's a unique place you facilitated? Um, the third store, story basement of the Pentagon in a vault that had a big bank vault door. Yep, that's a good one. <laughs> What's a not directly facilitation related experience you think every facilitator should have? Um, teaching a classroom of 30 fifth graders who all have questions for you. <laughs> Great. What is a book or books that you think facilitators would benefit from reading? Um, the Art of Persuasion 
which I'm reading right now. The Art of Persuasion. Cool. Um, do you have any online resources that you think other people should check out? Um, Mike Rohde's sketchnotes.com or sketchnoting.com. Um, am I allowed to plug? Sure, yes. Learn to scribe.com, which is the online version of our Rockstar, Rockstar Scribe course, and uh, graphicfacilitation.com. Great. Yeah. Um, also, final is David Sibbett and The Grove are the, the really the masters of creating templates that facilitators can use. So if you consider yourself non-visual facilitator, the Grove has a lot of templates and resources for you. Great. Cool. OK, and then the last question we have for you is, what's one piece of advice that you have for everyone listening? <laughs> Experiment and have fun. This is a real gift to be able to work with people that are trying to figure out stuff. So just experiment with things and have fun. Awesome. Um, Peter, where can people find you? Are you active on social media? Any like this is the place for like connect with me here and do and do these things to keep up with what you're doing. Uh, Instagram is where I'm at right now. So Peter Durand on Instagram. I've pretty much dropped off Facebook and it and Twitter and all that stuff. But tons of graphic recorders, graphic facilitators are on Instagram and they're showing the behind the scenes. And so uh, I think that's a really great place to learn. Yeah, cool. So it's just at Peter Durand? Uh, yes. Cool. All right. Yeah, we'll put a link to that as well and links to all the things that you've mentioned in, in the description and the uh, show notes of this video. Um, Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. For all your sharing. Uh, I really appreciate it. Well, you guys are providing a real gift to everybody. And I know it's a, it's a way for you to learn from people, but um, I, making this transparent, this the dark arts <laughs> transparent, and realizing that we're all trying to figure it out is a real gift. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. It was awesome. I'm like, I can already feel my Instagram feed change as you said that. I was like, oh no, that is going to be a, a world I'm about to embark into. So, uh, excited about that. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for all of your, all of your nuggets of knowledge. And we'll um, talk to you more. Thanks, Meg, Sam. You guys do a great job. This was thank really you. fun. I appreciate it. Great. All right. We're going to sign off. Thanks for listening. All right. Thanks, everybody. We made it through two hours. <laughs>